group for uh, coffee fellowship, and, and we did even let people know in advance that there was strawberry angel food. Yeah. Very good. Special occasion? Oh, okay. Karen's birthday. Okay, very good. Good, good to, to share the blessings. And at Mary Alice, do you want to introduce your guests? <laughs> we talk about me. <laughs> no, you didn't say that. sign out 
after this Friday, so then there'll be a sign that says fish fry on Friday. Uh, so look forward to that. Also, if you know of anyone who's moved or phone number changed, please let Linda know in the office. She may already have it, but she may not. So any updates to that yearbook sheet, she wants to get that printed this week. So please do that. Um, and with that, I invite you to stand. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Greet one another with a wave. We're so grateful for health. And one another. And one another. And we center ourselves. That we've come to this place to worship God. God who is gracious and merciful. We gather to worship the Holy Trinity. One God who makes a way for us to the wilderness, walks with us, and guides us on our pilgrimage. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets can be hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we might more perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if we say that we have no sin or pretend that sin does not cause real harm, we're deceiving ourselves and truth is not in us. But when we confess our sins, God, who is gracious and merciful, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let's ponder what we can give to the Lord. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have spent time in your word and in prayer as we could. We have not trusted in your promises. We have ignored your prophets' warnings in our own day. We have the inheritance of your grace. We have failed to recognize and welcome your presence in our midst. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Assure us of your love along our journey. Teach us to follow your ways, your patience and mercy, and move our hearts to love and help our neighbors. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the word draws you near, and all who call out to the Lord shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again, gathers you under his wings and love, Hear the good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven, and you are clothed in his righteousness. Thanks be to God. Gather him today. God of our life, our glorious Lord.
Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. God of transformation, we you welcome, welcome the wayward, and, and you embrace us all with your mercy. By our baptism, we are clothed in garments of your grace. You feed us at the table of your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I remember in 2002 when the conflict began then, worshiping at St. John's in Des Moines, and on the altar was a candle for peace. This candle signifies our prayers with all the people of God for peace in the world. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is from Joshua 5, verses 9 through 12. Today's first reading marks the new beginning for the generation of Israelites who grew up in the wilderness. Manna had been their food. God had provided, they gathered and prepared it. Now in the promised land, God provides in an unusual way. Now the reading from the fifth chapter of Joshua, beginning with the ninth verse. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the shame of your slavery in Egypt. So that place has been called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, they celebrated Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the first month, the month that marked their exodus from Egypt. The very next day they began to eat unleavened bread, and roasted grain harvested from the land. No manna appeared that day, and it was never seen again. So from that time on, the Israelites ate from the cross of Canaan. The words of God, words of life. Thanks be to God. Now join in the responsive reading from Psalm 32, verses 1 through 11, a psalm from David. <coughs> Oh, what joy for those whose rebellion is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those who record the Lord has cleared of sin, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, I was weak and miserable, because I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and, and stopped, stopped trying to hide them. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Therefore, let all the godly confess their rebellion to you while there is time that they may not drown in the flood waters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. Our second lesson today comes from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 through 21. Today's second reading answers the question of what does it mean to be made new through believing Jesus is God's own son. Receiving him as a brother and example come to set us free from fearful thinking. Now the reading from the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, beginning with verse 16. So we have stopped evaluating others by what the world thinks about them. Once I mistakenly thought of Christ that way, as though he were merely a human being. How differently I think about him now. 
What this means is that those who become Christians become new persons. They are not the same anymore, for the old life is gone. A new life has begun. All this newness of life is from God, who brought us back to himself through what Christ did. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. This is the wonderful message he has given us to tell others. We are Christ's ambassadors, and God is using us to speak to you. We urge you, as though Christ himself were here pleading with you, be reconciled to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. The Word of God, words of life. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Today's Gospel reading, the story of two brothers, but perhaps in the workplace you've encountered something like this, where there's one who's very responsible, does what they need to do, and there's one who's looking for the way to do the least, and suffers some consequence on account of that, and maybe learns a lesson. God loves both. God wants both to be reconciled with himself and us with one another. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise. We give you thanks and praise. That in your power, that in your power, there is a way. There is a way. For grace and reconciliation. For grace and reconciliation. Peace in the world. Peace in the world. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand for a gospel affirmation? Father saw him coming. 
filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to his the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Kill the calf we have been fattening in the pen. We must celebrate with a feast. For the son of mine was dead, and now is returned to life. He was lost. And now is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants, What was going on? Your brother is back, he told him, and your father's killed the calf we were fattening and has prepared a great feast. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry, wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, All these years I've worked hard for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. In all that time, you never gave me one, even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when the son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing him the finest calf we have? The father said to him, Look, dear son, you and I are very close and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He is lost, but now he is found. The Gospel of the Lord. <laughs> for Rome and other notorious sinners. I imagine Jesus knew that all of his audience would be drawn into this story as he described the disrespectful way the young son treated his position in the family, asking for an inheritance while his father was still alive, squandering it the way he did, suffering hunger and desperation due to a famine they might have thought that was just, justice for his abhorrent behavior. But Jesus knew that it would be those Pharisees and teachers of the religious law that they were the ones who would still be smiling inwardly as Jesus described the young man coming to his senses, believing that he was no longer worthy to be counted as a son and would plead to be accepted as a servant. Yet the other people in the audience, I want to believe that they knew personally what it is to repent to God and know that they needed to come before God and to trust God. These are the others who were coming to hear Jesus teach. And I believe Jesus' words of lifting them so that they could stand and face life in the grace of God Almighty's love, even though they had messed up. When Jesus described the father watching for his wayward son to return, seeing him a long way off, one of those Pharisees and teachers of the religious law, it might have felt like an earthquake had begun underneath their feet. It 
kept rolling as Jesus described the Father, filled with love and compassion for this wayward son, ran out to greet him, embraced him, and kissed him. And then it was the younger son's repentance, his words to his father, Father, I have sinned against both God and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I think that settled the ground for those Pharisees and teachers of religious law when they heard that. Those words of repentance said, yes, Jesus gets us. Forgive me for being critical. But I imagine those Pharisees and teachers of the law wanted Jesus to see this wayward person as they did, as someone deserving of punishment. But Jesus had a different idea in mind. I believe they were caught off guard by the extravagant behavior that Jesus attributes to the Father in this story. Their yeah, yeah, turns to, oh no, no, is the Father. Doesn't even seem to pay attention to the Son's repentance. Rather, commands that the finest robe in the house be brought and put on this filthy child. A ring and sandals, restoring his place in the family. The calf and the fat, fattening pen be killed to celebrate the return of the prodigal son with a feast. In his storytelling, Jesus has the Father twice state his rationale for this. The son of mine who is dead is alive. He was lost, but now he is found. We'll shout something similar to that on Easter morning. The one who was crucified and buried has been raised from the dead. He is risen indeed. Well, Jesus was never lost. His dying. His dying for the forgiveness of our sins is the most extravagant expression of love and forgiveness ever. Meanwhile, in Jesus' story, the older stories, the older son's point of view could lead you to imagine that there had never been music or dancing in that house before. Credit to the older brother's account. He'd been dutifully working in the field. The party had started without him. Hearing the music and dancing in the house, he had to ask one of the servants, what's going on? And I think the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and listening to Jesus' story were just as dismayed as that older brother receiving the explanation from a servant. Well, your brother's back. Your father's killed the fatted calf and we're preparing a great feast. We are celebrating because of his safe return. Well, I don't believe Jesus expected that portion of his audience to be any happier with the turn of events than the older brother as Jesus described in his story. Jesus' words revealed that he knew his, their hearts, our hearts. His story relates their thoughts. The older brother was angry. He wouldn't go in to join the celebration. So the father came out and begged him. Picture. But he replied, after all these years, I've worked hard for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. In all that time, you have never given me a young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when the son of yours who squandered his inheritance came back, you celebrated by killing the finest calf we have? The response Jesus spoke from the father in the story's point of view is something for all of us to chew on. Ponder and wonder, is this not an example of how God's ways are higher than our ways? What is of highest importance to God is relationship. 
relationship with each and every one of us. Commentator Joy J. Moore put, in, put it this way, God is more interested in community than canceling someone, more willing to reconcile than rebuke. Look, dear son, you're and I are always close, the Father said. Everything I have is yours. The Father in Jesus' story pleads with his oldest son. Yet we had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother who was dead has come back to life. He's lost, but now he is found. This change that Jesus wants to see, Paul describes in our second reading today. We've stopped evaluating others by what the world thinks of them. Once I mistakenly thought of Christ this way, as though he were merely a human being, how differently I think about him now. What this means is that those who became believers in Jesus become new persons, they're not the same anymore. The old life is gone. A new life begun. A new life in grace and peace. From a human point of view, the father of Jesus' story could have said to the older brother something that would have eased the tension in the story. Could have said, don't worry about your younger brother. In fact, you don't even have to count him as a brother anymore on account of his sin. He knows he doesn't deserve that place and is willing to be a servant to you and I. Could you imagine Jesus saying that? Do you know why he would never say that? Jesus was not going to let those Pharisees and teachers of the religious law continue to look down on others. Imagining that God's ability to love and forgive is limited to how we behave. No, God loves us and forgives us even before we know how great a gift His mercy is. To forgive as the Father in Jesus' story extravagantly forgives is God's prerogative. What is impossible for humankind is possible with God as He does His work in and us Continuing with Paul's new understanding. All this newness of life is from God who brought us back to himself. God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. This wonderful message he has given to us to tell others we are Christ's ambassadors. And God is using us to spread the truth of his abundant love and mercy. Thanks be to God. It stretches our imagination, doesn't it? It requires trust in God's abundant mercy to see that the Father in Jesus' story can't imagine the party without both of them. And them reconciled to one another. Jesus told this story I believe, for Israel's leaders, those religious leaders, to be set free from keeping track of other people's sins, from measuring their righteousness by condemning others. And still today, Jesus' words have the power to get the self-righteous to step off of their pedestals, start seeing themselves as others see and experience them, Counting the wrongs of others against them, leading to repentance of limiting God's power to love only them, and being reconciled to God and in the power of the Holy Spirit, begin to see others as God sees them through eyes of mercy, grace, hope, hope that He wants to give us as we know of His love and His mercy. Then held in God's grace, begin teaching God's children 
all that they have done for them, all that God has done for them. Becoming humble examples of God's reconciliation with sinners. You may not notice it, but Jesus ends that story in this way. We had to celebrate today. Your brother was lost, but now he's found. He's restored to me, and he's restored to you. What that means, we get to live into, is God helps us to repent in the season of Lent, to prepare our hearts to receive the fullness, the full measure of his grace on Easter morning, as God has done the impossible, raising the dead to new life. Showing us how powerful his love is. Will you pray with him? Almighty and merciful Savior, Lord, we thank you that you come to us in ways that we did not expect. Lord, we thank you that, as the psalmist knows, you are reliable. Your grace, your mercy, your strength, your protection. So, Lord, no matter what in the world challenges us, a co-worker, a neighbor, even within the family of the church, that that cannot change your love for us and your desire for us to be free to love others as you love them. So Lord, we thank you for your son, his death and resurrection. And Lord, lead us on new paths, familiar paths of grace and love through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. The love that will not let you go is our end today.
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this point, we worship God with our offering. When God has done so much, how can we put forward? but rather give a portion of what he has given us for his, for his good work. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, source of all that is. Through your goodness you have blessed us abundantly. We present these gifts along with our time and talents to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all you do. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord, through the sacrifice of you have new life. Amen. Jesus, we can die to sin and live in anticipation of the life to come. 
with those sheltered in your love and gathered at your heavenly banquet. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Please stand for the Lord's Prayer. With one voice, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Lord makes his face to shine upon you and gracious to you. The Lord looks upon you with favor and gives you peace. Amen. Amen.